Thank you everyone for the break. Um, and I am now pleased to reopen the ACIP meeting for the next session, which is um, a presentation by Dr. Dubofsky on the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy in adults ages 18 and older. If you could please pull up the slides, that would be wonderful. Great. Uh, good morning. My name is Philip Dubofsky, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Novavax. We are pleased to have this opportunity to present our data for the NVX2373 vaccine. Our vaccine provides an important new approach in the fight against COVID-19. We believe supportive policy recommendations will improve vaccine availability and accessibility with the ultimate goal of increasing vaccination rates in the U.S. Our COVID-19 vaccine is based on Novavax's platform technology, a recombinant protein antigen formulated as a particle, and our matrix M adjuvant, which is a saponin-based adjuvant. Saponin-based adjuvants are used in other proof vaccines, and the adjuvant is important in helping our vaccine generate broad immune responses, including against variants. Later on, I'll show you some data on this. Our vaccine has key attributes that supports increased access and ease of use. This is a Nintendo's vial, is a preservative-free, ready-to-use liquid suspension. It can be transported, stored at refrigerator temperatures, making it easy to ship, store, and administer. Each dose contains five micrograms of antigen and 50 micrograms of matrix M adjuvant. Two doses are administered three weeks apart with a 0.5 mL intramuscular injection using standard needles and syringes. Now, the authorized indication in the U.S. is for individuals 18 years of age and older. So uh, currently, vaccination in the U.S. is incomplete. You've seen this twice before today. Uh, this is the data from the CDC, and you can see that one in 10 Americans have yet to receive a single dose of COVID vaccines, and the rates are even lower for a priming two-dose series and boosters. We believe a protein-based alternative may help increase vaccine uptake in individuals who prefer a well-understood vaccine platform. Our clinical development program included four studies. These studies constitute the body of data used for global regulatory approval. Today, we'll focus on the phase three studies shown here in dark blue. Safety and efficacy was initially evaluated in the UK, followed by an even larger study in the US and Mexico to enable licensure within the US. As part of the US-Mexico phase three study, effectiveness and clinical efficacy was studied in adolescents 12 to 17 years of age, and these data are currently under review by the FDA. Okay, let's, let's briefly summarize the phase three results. Vaccine efficacy against mild, moderate, or severe disease in both phase three trials was 90%. Importantly, there was 100% protection against severe disease. These two trials were conducted when the virus had started to evolve rapidly. In fact, the majority of cases in both studies were attributed to variants of concern or variants of interest. High levels of efficacy were observed against these drug variants, which we believe is a hallmark of our vaccine technology. I'll focus on the US-Mexico phase three study, study 301, because it was conducted in the US population and the data from the study was the basis of authorization by the FDA. In study 301, we randomized participants two to one to receive vaccine or placebo. And we did this so that we could gather additional safety data on the vaccine from a larger number of participants. About four months after the initial vaccination period, participants remained blinded and we crossed over to the opposite treatment arm. And this was done so that all participants in the study could receive active vaccine. Participants are being followed up two years following primary vaccination. Demographics and baseline characteristics were well balanced between the, the two arms as shown. 13% of participants were over the age of 65. It's important to note that enrollment in older adults was somewhat limited. This was because COVID-19 vaccines became authorized and recommended for those greater than 65 uh, while we were enrolling. Black or African-American participants made up 12% of the study population 7% were American Indian, and 22% were Hispanic or Latino, which is representative of the overall U.S. population. In line with one of our study goals, 95% of participants were considered at increased risk for COVID-19, either due to underlying medical conditions or their occupations. We achieved our primary efficacy endpoint in the study of 90% protection from mild, moderate, and severe disease. The lower bound was 84%. In fact, there were only 17 cases in the 17,000 or so vaccine recipients compared to 79 cases in the 8,000 or so placebo recipients. As a reminder, we randomized participation two to one to receive vaccine. As I mentioned earlier, 
we observed 100% protection against moderate or severe illness, an important secondary endpoint. This means that all the cases in the vaccine group were mild. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the vaccine showed 93% efficacy against variants of concern or variants of interest. The lower bound was 86%. The most commonly identified variants were alpha, iota, epsilon, and gamma, with fewer cases being attributed to beta, delta, kappa, and zeta. Uh, once again, all of the variant cases that did occur in the vaccine arm were mild in severity. As noted on the right-hand side of the slide, efficacy was 97% for isolates that would be considered more closely matched to the original vaccine strain. The lower bound was 74%. Efficacy against these matched strains was pre-specified as a key secondary endpoint of the study. The vaccine provided consistent high levels of protection across all groups. As we get into subgroup analysis with fewer events, the confidence intervals widen, but the point estimates continue to support vaccine efficacy. So to conclude, our vaccine was highly efficacious in preventing COVID-19. Its efficacy was demonstrated against all the variants circulating during the study. The vaccine also provided complete protection from moderate or severe disease in adults. Uh, and finally, our vaccine demonstrated consistently high efficacy in adults across subgroups, including race, gender, and in individuals with medical comorbidities. Now turning to safety. The total safety database includes approximately 50,000 people enrolled across four studies. This is a large database that can provide us confidence that we have a well-characterized safety profile that supports a positive benefit risk, as well as a favorable reactogenicity profile across a diverse population. Let me begin by summarizing our solicited adverse events collected through electronic diary entries for seven days following each vaccination. Shown here is the local reactogenicity event after the first dose. Participants 18 to 64 years of age are represented on the top panel and those 65 and older on the bottom. Within each column, the left are vaccinated participants and the placebo participants are on the right. Overall, there were fewer local events in those greater than 65 years of age compared to younger adults. Pain and tenderness were the most commonly reported events. And while many participants did not report reactogenicity events at all, those who did mostly reported events that were grade one or grade two which is mild or moderate in severity shown here in blue. Grade three or higher, shown in yellow, occurred at low rates. Overall, these events resolved quickly with a median duration of one to two days. As expected, events occurred more frequently following the second dose. And again, as expected, more participants in the vaccine group experienced these symptoms. Most events reveal mild or moderate in severity with low numbers of grade three or higher events. The median duration was one to two days. So now let me turn to systemic reactogenicity. Displayed in this slide are the systemic events after the first dose. Malaise, fatigue, muscle pain, and headache are most commonly reported. Once again, we see lower frequencies in those 65 years of age or older, and the vast majority of events were reported as mild or moderate, resolved quickly with a median of duration of one to two days. Notably, the rates of fever were quite low in less than 1% of vaccinees. Following the second dose, while higher overall, most systemic events remain mild to moderate in severity. Rates of grade three or higher events were uncommon uh, with a median duration of one to two days. And even after the second dose, a low proportion of participants reported fever. Okay, moving on to an overview of unsolicited adverse events. Overall, the frequency of unsolicited adverse events was comparable between vaccine and placebo groups, and severe adverse events were reported in few participants. Medically attended adverse events, as well as potentially immune-mediated conditions, were similar between groups. Uh, SAEs were also balanced across vaccine and placebo groups. And as you can see in the low, last row, deaths occurred at similar low rates between treatment arms. Because of the importance of this topic, we'd like to present the myocarditis pericarditis data from our pooled safety database. Through the investigations that were described earlier uh, today, this committee has seen the natural background events of myocarditis will occur in any sufficiently large database. We've also learned that young males are at higher risk for both vaccine-induced myocarditis and other forms of myocarditis, uh, most often caused by nonspecific infections. Uh, COVID infections can also cause myocarditis. It's important to note that our studies were largely conducted during the time of heightened awareness 
for myocarditis. And uh, now for our data. Uh, overall, in the placebo controlled phase of our clinical development program, the rates of myocarditis were balanced between vaccine and placebo arms at 0.007% for vaccine and 0.005% for placebo. No pericarditis was reported. In study 301, one case occurred in the active arm and one case in the placebo arm. As a reminder, there was a two to one randomization in the study in order to increase the sample size of vaccinees. We also observed one case that occurred in the active arm of study 302, which was the UK phase three study. Of the two cases in vaccine recipients, one 67 year old male also had concurrent severe COVID infection after dose one. And the other case uh, from study 302 occurred in a 19 year old male three days after the second dose of vaccine and was without a definitive alternative cause. In the post crossover portion of study 301 and 302, where all the participants had been exposed to our vaccine, events of myocarditis or pericarditis occurred with an expected background rates as determined by the EMA access study. Uh, this study was specifically designed to determine background rates of interest for COVID vaccines. There were three reports of myocarditis or pericarditis and all had alternate plausible infectious etiologies. One notable case occurred in a 16 year old male two days after the second crossover dose of vaccine uh, who had a viral illness diagnosed by a healthcare provider. One 20 year old male had strep throat preceding the events of pericarditis, and this was diagnosed by EKG findings with a normal troponin level. I'd like to mention that in this list, we did not include here a case of a 28 year old male who had features of myocarditis, but was diagnosed by his attending cardiologist with non ST elevation myocardial infarct. Our latest monthly uh, summary safety report with post-authorization data includes more than a million doses administered and was submitted in July with a data cutoff of June 30th. For the spontaneous report using a broad SMQ search strategy, 68 potential reports were identified. And as is typical for these spontaneous reports, many had limited information. Out of the potential reports from this broad search, 17 met the Brighton collaboration definition of definite or probable myocarditis or pericarditis. As a result of our discussion with the FDA, the US label includes a warning that states, clinical trials data provide evidence for increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis. We're carefully monitoring our post authorization data to understand the nature and magnitude of this risk. Additionally, we attempt to follow up each case with target questionnaires and these data are being communicated to all regulatory agencies in our monthly summary safety reports. Our closed monitoring will also include post authorization safety studies, which cover large populations in administrative claims databases and electronic health records. For these other specific events of interest in our clinical development program, there were no reports of anaphylactic reactions or TTS in our integrated safety database. However, based on two post authorization reports of anaphylaxis, this class labeling has been included in our label. There was also one case of neuropathy from UK study 302, uh, where we received recent follow-up information that meets the Brighton collaboration definition of Guillain-Barre syndrome. We'll of course continue to monitor these carefully uh, in all of our post-authorization surveillance activities. Because pregnant women were excluded from all of our studies, there's limited information on pregnancy. For all uh, children, uh, all women of childbearing potential, a negative urine pregnancy test was required as screening and prior to vaccinations. However, as in all large studies with long follow-up, we did have some reports of pregnancies. As of uh, 15th of March, uh, a total of 147 pregnancies were reported across the entire clinical program. 56 of these pregnancies are still ongoing and 41 resulted in live birth. 23 experienced miscarriages, 13 women elected to have voluntary terminations, and one had an ectopic pregnancy. There were no fetal deaths or stillbirths reported. Overall, this data does not indicate a potential risk for mother or fetus and is generally consistent with background rates. There are no specific restrictions for pregnant women in our US or global labels. We also have plans to conduct multiple post authorization studies to look at additional safety and effect effectiveness data. We will be conducting two effectiveness studies and two safety studies using administrative claims and electronic health record databases 
to characterize the safety profile in the post-marketing settings. In study 405, on the right-hand side is a global registry that will provide us important data in pregnant women who receive our vaccine. Okay, I'll, I'll now briefly review our vaccine's immune response against the current Omicron variants and describe our next steps. Here we see in a multidimensional presentation the immune responses from our U.S.-Mexico phase three study called antigenic cartography. This method displays the ability of the vaccine-induced antibody to recognize variant spike proteins. The prototype is indicated in green, and the closer the variant uh, appears to the green circle, the better the immune response recognizes that variant. Each square on the grid represents a two-fold difference in, in antibody level. Those two squares represent a four-fold difference, and three squares is an eight-fold difference. Here we show the antibody binding after, two do after the two-dose priming series. Uh, while there was 100% seroconversion to all Omicron subvariants after two doses, the antigenic difference between the matched prototype strain and the Omicron subvariants is 7.9 to 11.8 fold different. We annotated the antigenic distance uh, between BA5 in pink and prototype in green because of the recent FDA strain change recommendations. On the right, uh, after a single boost, the antigenic distance decreases for all of the Omicron variants with BA5 decreasing to just a 2.9-fold difference, which could be considered a masked response. We believe this phenomenon is driven by recognition of conserved epitopes and further enhanced by the matrix adjuvant. This analysis leads us to believe that as we immunize with additional doses of our recombinant spike protein vaccine, we minimize the antigenic distance and begin to observe a more universal-like response against variants. Clearly, we, we don't know what will emerge after BA5, so forward drift will be a key issue to be addressed for all COVID vaccines. But boosting with our technology may be an attractive option as it provides both high levels of antibody recognizing variants and a durable immune response. And although it's not certain a variant-specific vaccine will provide significant clinical benefit, we're evaluating a number of constructs in clinical studies. This is the ongoing study where we'll be comparing the performance of our prototype vaccine to a BA1 variant vaccine and a BA5 variant vaccine. Additionally, we will look at two different bivalent format vaccines containing both prototype plus BA1 and prototype plus BA2. Uh, we'll compare the variant specific immune responses among the trial arms to support a data driven decision about the utility of variant vaccines as it applies to our adjuvanted recombinant protein technology. And if it continues to be deemed desirable, our goal is to have variant vaccines available in the fourth quarter. So, in summary, my vaccine achieved high levels of efficacy in two large randomized controlled phase three studies, including high efficacy against variants of concern and variants of interest. My vaccine is based on a platform that is well understood. Recombinant protein vaccines have been used globally for decades, and this may be important, especially for those who are vaccine hesitant. Our adjuvant, Matrix M, is a natural supponent product, and supponent based adjuvants are used throughout the world. The data show that combining our SARS-CoV-2 spike protein with the immune-enhancing adjuvant stimulates a broad and robust immune response and provides high levels of clinical efficacy. Importantly, our vaccine is not highly reactogenic, and this may be important for vaccine compliance as boosting continues to be recommended. And finally, our vaccine presentation and storage supports ease of use and, ease and wide access. Finally, to the tens of thousands of people who volunteered for our clinical trials in the U.S. and abroad, the healthcare providers, investigators, study site personnel, and all of our partners, thank you. Your involvement is making a difference in the lives of people around the world, and we are very, very grateful for your contribution. Okay, thank you. I'll turn the podium back over to Dr. Lee, and we're prepared to answer any questions. Thank you. This presentation is now open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Paling. So thank you, Dr. Davinsky, for a clear presentation. Um, this is really important. Um, one quick question is um, the placebo. What was the placebo used in the studies? Yeah, the placebo used in this study uh, and in our studies was normal saline. Okay, normal saline was the comparison. Okay, perfect. And then um, I wanted um, to um, ask you about, um, there was one case of neuropathy that met the GBS uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome a definition. Could you tell us a little bit about when that was, um, when that developed and any more information you have about that case? 
Yeah, I think I'll I'll call uh, Dr. Kim, who's our uh, chief safety officer. Uh, he may have some details on that case, but uh, I think that it is important to know that in the post uh, authorization period, we have seen a number of cases of GBS. Dr. Kim, do you, do you have the details handy on the uh, on that case? Yes, this is uh, this this case occurred in a older woman in her, her 60s, um, and she experienced over the course of a year progressive motor and sensory uh, deficits, and uh, and also had laboratory testing that could confirm that through EMG and other other laboratory tests. Um, the the uh, case definition was only met recently as we got follow-up information uh, because there, there was some delay in reporting by the uh, by the patient participant uh, as uh, the initial presentation was quite mild and and so uh, but then as she was being followed up through the year and got additional testing um, the progressive nature of the motor and sensory deficits uh, were confirmed, and then and she uh, did improve with steroid treatment, and uh, and and so uh, just recently, with the information that we did receive, she uh, the, the uh, case did meet uh, Brighton collaboration case definition for Guillain-Barré syndrome. Okay, and could you clarify about um, the timing of um, the developing of these neurologic symptoms and the vaccine dose? Yes, the. Um, I don't have the details right in front of me, and, and maybe I can pull that up and get back to you. But uh, the 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 initial symptoms that that presented as tingling and uh, did occur just within a few weeks of the of the first dose, I believe. But I, I can check on that and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the overview that you've provided, um, Dr. Dostoevsky. Um, could you repeat the, the variants um, that you were able to look at um, against the original strain of your product? And do you have any data related to um, effectiveness against Omicron? Yeah, so, so the, the uh, both efficacy studies were uh, conducted uh, before Omicron emerged. So the we don't have any efficacy data that speaks to Omicron specifically. Um, what we do have is we have uh, an evaluation of our immune responses. And first, uh, let, let me answer the um, uh, other part of your question about what it is we actually saw. So represented on the slide are, are, the, uh, ICE, are the variants we were able to detect in our US phase three study. You can see we had a broad amount of variants, predominantly alpha, uh, but a smattering of the other uh, variants of concern and variants of interest that were identified at that time. Um, and I believe you had a question about what we know about Omicron. Uh, I mean, the, the data that I showed you with the anagenic cartography uh, is some of the data we have about Omicron, and it shows that really, even after a two-dose priming series, uh, we had a 100% seroconversion conversion to all them, including VA5, um, and that anaging distance narrowed uh, as uh, as we gave a subsequent dose. Uh, but perhaps it'd be useful to to share with you this data. This is data once again from our U.S. Mexico um, phase three study. And the left hand side, what I'm displaying is the IgG responses uh, against prototype compared to BA1, BA2, and BA5. Uh, and the dashed line is, is a line that re represents a, the, approximately the levels you saw in the phase three study. Uh, and in that study, we obviously had good protection um, against, uh, against not only the prototype, but a, against the earlier variants. On the right-hand side, you see what happens when we give a boosting dose. And really, for all of those um, variants, we get immune responses that really are very similar to what we saw in the phase three study. And I, I display IgG data because recently the U.S. government um, and uh, with their collaborators um, published a, um, a paper showing that for our vaccine, at least, IgG seems to be the best correlate of protection uh, compared to the other immunologic parameters they, they, um, they measured. And this was part of the uh, old Operation Warp Speed uh, effort uh, at the, done in Seattle by Peter Gilbert and his group. Thank you. Dr. Cotton. 
Thanks very much for the data you presented. Um, I am especially interested in protecting immunocompromised patients. It looks like there's not a lot of data available with Novavax and immunocompromised. I see that the Australians recommended that it could be used as part of the three-dose primary series in immunocompromised patients. Do you have data in that population and or will it be included in the study that you mentioned that which just started in May of 2022, where you're looking at Novavax after uh, mRNA vaccine? Thank you. Yeah, so we have limited information uh, about how the vaccine, especially multiple doses of vaccine, um, perform in people of various levels of, of immunocompromised. We did in our US phase three study uh, include some participants um, who were living with HIV. Um, and um, what you can see here on the left hand side is the immune responses in those uh, who were HIV negative versus those that were living with HIV. And once again, we're looking at IgG data. And you can see there is a small diminution in, um, in the overall titers uh, in those who are living with HIV. On the right-hand side, and this is a small data set, only nine participants, but these were people who are based on seropositive, so who were previously exposed to, um, uh, to COVID and then were vaccinated. And you can see that, that with that priming, uh, the two of uh, those series give a very high titer well above that, which was associated by protection in uh, the uh, uh, phase three study. Now we have a, a study that we're conducting in South Africa. Uh, enrollment was completed a while ago. And what we're evaluating there in, in um, people with, without HIV, as well as more immunocompromised, as well as the less immunocompromised people living with HIV, is a three-dose series versus a two-dose series of, uh, with various uh, intervals to try to understand how best to use our vaccine in this population. Thank you. Could you um, specify a little more about the people living with HIV? Are we, do you know if they had CD4 counts under 200? Um, yeah, these, were, or, these were very well controlled people that I, from the data I showed you. And in South Africa, is it a more mixed? It's a, it's a heterogeneous population. We, we have people who are well controlled and people who are less well controlled. And will we have, you know, it's estimated that about 3% of the U.S. population is immunocompromised. And as we've seen, they're much more vulnerable to severe life-threatening infection and then less responsive to vaccination. Does Novavax have work underway with non-HIV uh, immunocompromised populations? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I think that the, uh, our post-marketing phase four studies are really going to be able to address this quite well. Uh, these are very, very large studies we have planned uh, in, in, in uh, these uh, claims databases, and we should be able to get a view on that. Uh, you know, we're also looking for opportunities to evaluate the vaccines in various populations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, it's, it's exciting to have um, another vaccine plus one, as you've mentioned, in a more traditional format. I have a few questions. Um, did you state what your definitions were of mild, moderate, and severe? Um, yes. Um, so the efficacy definitions um, really, uh, here, here's the definition, and, and I'll, I'm trying to pull up the, the uh, mild, moderate, severe definitions. What we looked at was uh, PCR-confirmed uh, cases that occurred seven days after dose two. So that was our, our definition. And, and the success criteria were those which were uh, projected in the early days. Uh, as the VE had to um, had to have a lower bound of greater thirty percent, and we handily met all that. Um, let and, with me... and and with respect to that, um, there was they had to have symptomatology to be tested. You did not test routinely, so we don't have information on asymptomatic disease. We have information on asymptomatic disease uh, by following people who were uh, anti-N seroconverters or who were PCR positive. So let me, let me uh, here I have the case definition so you can take a glance at them. Uh, and this is covered also in the New England Journal publications we have on it. Um, but, but you can see that, that really the severe disease was based more or less on the CDC criteria. Uh, and um, we, we didn't actually count trivial disease so we wanted at least something which we thought was clinically significant, even for uh, even for mild, even for uh, mild disease. Now, as far as your question, and, about, and, I'm sorry. And where did I'm sorry. Going back to that slide. 
So where did hospitalization uh, go in there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. So um, hospitalization, you, you see um, severe, you see um, uh, ICU admission, but we actually saw a lot more hospitalization than we're able to capture a severe disease. And the reason for this was because people who, we had a very strict case definition of the PCR having to be conducted at the University of Washington. So we had a number of people who were uh, all in the placebo group who were hospitalized, uh, but couldn't meet this uh, specific case definition. In fact, there were five hospitalizations uh, in the placebo group, none in the vaccine group in the study who were hospitalized. So the, the true rates uh, of severe disease are, are actually much higher than reflected in the when it's what we were able to bring forward. And could a moderate disease be hospitalized or did that take you to severe? I don't see. No, uh, hospitalization was not a specific criteria for um, uh, in, for severity. Doc, uh, Dr. Dunkel is the physician who ran the study. She's the global medical lead. Lisa, do you have anything to say about hospitalization where it fits into the criteria for severity? No, um, you're, you're accurate that we did not use that as a criterion for severity. Um, most of the participants who were hospitalized for COVID uh, did not have their PCRs confirmed at the University of Washington and therefore were counted as serious adverse events due to hospitalization. Um, and one of those that Philip mentioned actually succumbed to his disease but was not counted as an endpoint. So hospitalization was not a criterion for uh, severity. And let me just speak a little bit to your question about asymptomatic infection. Our, our best data from that comes from uh, the UK study 302, where we followed people for uh, up to six months. That's where we collected their, their cases with a median follow-up of uh, 101 days in that study. And uh, by looking at people who either circumverted to N or were PCR positive, uh, what we saw was a uh, efficacy against any infection, whether it be symptomatic or asymptomatic, of 83% with a lower bound of 75%. So obviously if you don't get infected, uh, you, you, can't, um, uh, you can't pass it on to your loved ones. You can't uh, breed uh, variants yourself and, and certainly you can't be impacted by long COVID, which, which is a growing uh, recognized problem now. So you said that the efficacy of 83 of asymptomatic or symptomatic, how about with the asymptomatic? Or did you have that many of those? Yeah, asymptomatic. Oh, we, we, we did. The asymptomatic w was, I, I don't have that uh, figure handy. It was um, modestly lower, I want to say in the 70s, but I don't have that specific value. And I'm sorry, can I go on? Or... Okay, how many more questions? Just, just checking in. I want to make sure we get to all the hands. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Sanchez. Um, maybe one more question. Well, um, I have more, but I, I do want to ask, um, you know, with the vaccine hesitancy and the manufacturing of this vaccine, uh, was there any use of abortive fetal cells in its, in its development? No. Thank None. You. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. And Dr. Sanchez, we can come back to you. I just want to make sure we get through the sure. hand. Um, Dr. Uh, I see Dr. Kim's hand is raised. Did you wish to respond to an earlier question? Yes. Yeah, so I, um, I have some of the more, some more detail. So, in, uh, in response to the Guillaume Bray's question, uh, it was a 65 year old female that, and this case occurred in our UK study 302, and it occurred about nine days after the post crossover dose, number one, and started with, uh, as I had mentioned, um, some, some tingling in, in her hands. And so then that progressed over, uh, over the next um, nine months into progressive uh, sensorimodal motor um, neuropathy that was confirmed by EMG findings. And that also, um, that also uh, manifested in some ataxia as well. And, uh, and the symptoms did improve after steroid, and steroid treatment. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Hayes? Yes, Carol Hayes at the American College of Nurse Midwives. I just had a question about the pregnancies that occurred. You said that you gave a pregnancy test before each vaccine administration. Could you just give me a brief, a little bit more information about how you discovered that they were pregnant and when during their vaccine um, investigation trial experiences that they were pregnant? 
And so the, the data I presented are really the totality of data from these studies that we started you know, almost two years ago. So, uh, and these people are still under, these women are still un, under surveillance now. So the vast majority of them obviously occurred um, in, in the distant time period after, uh, well, well after vaccination, vaccines were administered. But you bring up a, a good point. You know, these studies really rely on the women to tell us when they become pregnant and also to try to estimate when their last menstrual periods were. And without a systemic way to capture that data, uh, this data is incomplete in, in our hands. Yeah, recollection of last menses is incredibly unreliable in most women. That's right. And that's why we're really um, focusing on the, um, the C Viper study in, uh, to look at pregnancies going forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Thank you. And just following up on that question, could you bring that slide back up about the pregnant women? Because I think you had showed that you looked at 136 women, but maybe 25 had miscarriages. Um, that seemed like a very high rate of miscarriages to me compared to 136. So the, these rates are, are really difficult to compare with the denom denominator. And, and maybe I'll ask Dr. Kim to comment on this. Uh, but from our analysis, we think this this is pretty much within within um, the reported norms, Dr. Kim. Yeah, yes, that, that's that's correct. And and so as as we've been looking at this, and first firstly, uh, as we've been discussing, the pregnancies weren't systematically uh, collected, and so it's very hard to interpret this kind of data and compare it um, to background rates, but. With the data that we have, uh, and with a sort of a background rate um, that's around 20% in the general population of spontaneous abortions, uh, it, it is generally consistent with the background rate. Thank you. Yeah, the, the obvious problem is that people are much more likely to report when they have a poor outcome versus if they're just pregnant. So our denominator is not probably complete. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dries? Thank you. Um, I think, you know, thank you for the presentation. I think you explained very well a number of advantages that this vaccine has, including its storage, the fact that it's, you know, a, a well-known technology. But when I think about the people who are remaining out there who still need their primary series, you know, it seems like the best way to reach them will be through individual um, practices when they're seeing their physician for a provider for something else. They may be less likely to go seek out a vaccine at a pharmacy or at a dedicated vaccination event. <clears throat> and so, and I do worry that a provider, you know, is going to see, you know, ones and twos of these types of patients in a given day. Um, and, and despite the fact that I think CDC and others have said it's okay to waste the remaining doses in a, in a given vial if, you're, if you have the opportunity to vaccinate one person. I think people are still somewhat reluctant to do that. Um, and I know that you were asked to provide uh, this vaccine in multi-dose files, but I didn't know if there's a, a plan. I, I think it's a huge missed opportunity. Um, and I didn't know if there are plans moving forward to provide in the US at least um, single dose vials and, and it, would that have to go back through the FDA regulatory process? Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it would is the answer to the last question. Um, the, the format which is licensed in the U.S. is a 10-dose vial. Uh, we have other formats that are licensed in other territories and by our partners, including in pre-filled syringes in, in Korea. Uh, we are working uh, feverishly to get a lower format uh, presentations that we can submit to the regulators and get approval in, in due course. I have to say that we do have some experience with this vaccine being made available alongside other vaccines. Uh, in, in countries, and in, in certain countries, we have pretty decent visibility into how they're being used. So, uh, for instance, in, in Australia, uh, we know that about 60% of these vaccines that are being used down there are being used as a primary series, and that's in a, that's in a country where they have a choice of multiple vaccines, so people are, are selecting to use this one specifically. And the proportion is even higher in Korea, where a higher proportion are, are selecting to use this uh, use our vaccine when there are other choices available. So I think it's important to offer this as an opportunity, you know, as a, as a choice for people. It gives them some control and it allows uh, the participants or, or the vaccinees 
uh, their uh, positions in the health care, uh, public health community to weigh the benefits of risk of which party they choose to take. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eckert. Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out, uh, as the American College of OBGYN rep, that the rate of miscarriage is 17%, and the study is well within what is expected. Um, but I also did have a couple questions. One was, do you have any data on the matrix M adjuvant being used in other vaccines given to pregnant individuals? And the second is, do you have any data at the gestational age at birth of your live birth outcomes of women who were vaccinated? Thank you. So uh, this vaccine has uh, not been used in uh, women who are pregnant deliberately. Um, and the other supplement-based um, vaccines, which are authorized globally, are either used uh, against shingles, which would be in, in an elderly population, or in children for malaria vaccines, which would be in the younger population. So there's limited data available. We do have, obviously, a developmental and reproductive talk study, which was showed no uh, adverse impacts to either the, uh, um, the pups or the, the, the mothers. Um, and um, overall, I guess one, one thing to think about is that this is actually a fairly tiny amount of, of uh, adjuvant. We're talking about 50 micrograms is an extremely low dose. Thank you. You have, some, you have something else that I forgot. Yeah. The, do you have any data on the gestational age at birth in the women who had live birth after receiving the vaccine? Um, I don't know that we have that data summarized. Dr. Kim, is that something that, that you have access to? No, we don't. Have, we actually, as uh, so the, the, these reports, as, as we mentioned, is uh, they were spontaneously reported and they often come with uh, limited information and we do our best to follow up and try to get as much complete information as we can. A uh, vast majority of these cases do not have gestational age um, and, and we don't have that information. But, but once again, this is data that we uh, anticipate gathering in our uh, registry going forward. Well, Philip, if I, could I add to that? Um, in the 301 study, um, we did collect pregnancy as a as. Well, we ask that they be reported as a serious adverse event, not because it is a serious adverse event, but because that was the methodology that we had in place to follow the pregnancy. And our SAFE has followed these pregnancies, and the, the cases that have resulted in live birth have not been reported to have uh, been a preterm delivery, because that was one of the questions that we asked. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Oh, no, sorry, Dr. Duchin first, and then we'll go back to Dr. Paling. Thank you, Jeff Duchin, IDSA. Um, can you please review, um, if, I'm sorry if I missed it, the median duration of follow-up after dose two for uh, the data that you presented to us? And then I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about waning, what information we have about waning of protection over time and the likely need for a booster dose. Thank you. Yeah, so let me uh, address the first question, uh, the second question first, because I happen to have that data handy. Um, what I'm showing you here is data from uh, our US Australia phase one, phase two study. Uh, and in, in dark blue, you can see the immune responses against um, the prototype, and in light blue, against the BA1 variant. And what you can see is in day 35, after the primary uh, series, we achieved a tie of approximately 100,000, which decayed over six months. And, and this is almost predictable, right? This is the, the normal decay pattern associated with IgG. After a, a single boost of six months, we achieved high titers. Uh, they once again decayed over uh, the, the following six months. A couple of points here. One of them is that interval between six months and 12 months, that entire line is above the threshold we saw in our phase three study associated with protection. So uh, we believe that we're gonna be uh, in a place where we can provide good protection there. And the other point is if you follow the BA1 line, you can see that the gap between the dark blue and the light blue narrow. And this is um, really um, consistent with the energetic cartography I showed you. It shows us as we give subsequent doses, uh, the immune responses kind of converge even against these quite distant strains. 
Now, the question you asked about uh, meeting duration, were you thinking about it from a safety context or were you thinking about it from an efficacy context? Uh, thank you. Yes, from um, an efficacy context, please. Right. So the, the data, the primary data, uh, we had a um, median of a, approximately 60 days of observation. Okay. Thank you and very that much. Ranged, and, that, and that ranged, obviously. Um, you know, we had, we had to institute the crossover. So that kind of terminated our ability to have uh, continued placebo controlled follow-up. And are you aware of any data from those countries that have been using the vaccine longer about efficacy over time? Or you know, we, time? We're only just now approaching the, the point where we're the six month time point. Some, some countries where we are authorized, we're authorized as a boosting dose. Some we have policy recommendations that support boosting. But to date, we have not received uh, information uh, on uh, any kind of waning efficacy because okay. that data is still being uh, collected. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paley. I wanted to ask um, about the uh, median duration of follow-up for safety and a little bit more of a discussion about grade three responses. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so, um, I'm going to have to turn to, to Dr. Kim to talk about grade three uh, uh, reactions. But here's, here's the data on our safety follow-up. Um, and, and what you can see is, is that for um, the uh, COVID, uh, for our vaccine, we, we've had 5,500 person years follow-up compared to placebo. Uh, and that's the median duration of 92 days after dose one. Uh, there are comparable between placebo and vaccine group. And you can see that we provided a, a high uh, that those compliance was very good in our studies, so so people followed up quite well. Now, the, the grade threes, were you thinking about the grade threes as far as the uh, reactogenicity that we described? Uh, yes, the react, the both um, local as well as the systemic. Yeah. So I'm. It may take us some time to to pull up that data. I don't know that we have it. We've prepared to summarize it for for this. Uh, uh, presentation. While you're working on that, yeah. I, well, I, um, maybe I'll go back to Dr. Sanchez to ask his questions as well, and someone from your team can, um, if that's available, can pull that up. Okay. Uh, I'll go to Dr. Sanchez, and then uh, we'll close with Dr. Daly. So, Dr. Sanchez, do you have any additional questions? Thank you. And actually, they're related to the to the adverse effects. I'd like to hear more about your serious adverse effect events. Um, because, and and the um, you know it was one percent of them. I know that it was similar to placebo, but um, but you know I and you know the deaths that I know that's less than point one, but um, you know what you know what systems were involved. Um, I you know I'd, I'd like to look, to hear a little bit more about that. Yep. But the other but the other one also important to me, um, how many, you know, of the, of the short-term effects, um, did you capture whether it, it affected uh, work related? Because, you know, we hear with, um, you know, that people are, are taking, are not able to work after their, some of these vaccines and, um, or they take it at times that they know they're going to be off. Did you get any, did you um, look and see whether it interrupted with their their normal daily life. Yeah. So, so first for the um, for the SAEs, um, maybe I'll ask Dr. Kim to describe this data that I'm just putting up now. Yeah. So, uh, as this is Benny Kim, uh, I, I as you can see in this uh, in this slide, um, we've broken the SAEs into system organ class, and they were balanced between the uh, active and placebo arms, uh, if, if not lower. And so the infections and infestations, uh, part, part of that imbalance that weight, that's weighted against placebo is due to COVID infections. And, um, and so we, we didn't see any patterns that, that raise concerns here. Did you have any specific questions about SAEs? No, I, I, I wanted to see this. I wanted to see what, um, you know, how they were evaluated and what kind of systems they, they were. 
Yeah, and 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 the you, had, you had a question also about and what um, and the deaths that were um, reported. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? And the deaths that were reported. Um, so they were they're very um, very infrequent uh, as. Uh, Dr. Dubofsky show, showed in his uh, presentation, there were less than 0.1%. Okay. <laughs> and they did uh, sort of range what you would expect in the general population. And so there were some um, cardiovascular deaths that occurred um, at pretty much exactly the same incidence between the placebo and treatment arms, as well as just individual sort of scattering of different causes of death. That uh, even even things like accidents uh, uh, that that occur during uh, that, that can occur in the general population, and that was in the sixty days after. Well, we oh, we follow deaths uh, throughout the study, and so we continue to follow them. And so we have um, so so the deaths that we reported to the FDA and as part of our uh, emergency use authorization submission um, included pretty long follow up, greater than six months. And, and I'll, I just want to remind um, everyone that, that we specifically selected participants for the study who had pre-existing medical comorbidities. So that kind of enriched the population, both for SAEs as, as well as for, um, um, you know, that's their uh, primary diagnosis. Thank you. Dr. Kim, do you want to? Yeah, uh, and here's, here's a, a little bit more granularity on the deaths that that we were talking about. And so as you can see, uh, I mentioned even accidents like gunshot wounds and, and uh, accidental overdose. Uh, so there, there was, a, again, just a scattering of different causes. Um, the, and, and, and again, I, I know Dr. Dubofsky had reminded the committee about the two to one randomization, but I'll just issue another reminder that there was uh, more uh, participants who received vaccine than placebo in the pre-crossover portion of our study 301. And so you can see here the different deaths that were reported. In the short term, how many did you capture? How many um, of the short-term adverse events that um, were um, affected their daily life, um, meaning work-related that they had to miss work? Yeah, so we, we have an ongoing study actually looking at that specifically to try to understand, um, you know, the impact of our, our vaccine on, on uh, work and, and non-work. Now, that, as, as you know, the um, definition of the solicited events does include impacting um, activities of daily living as one of the potential definitions. So I, I think that those that were marked in yellow on the slides could be considered those that, that uh, had an impact against it. Although there are other, other places can get you to a grade three or grade four as well. So we don't have it broken out by specifically which of those uh, impacted ADL. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanna confirm before I move on to Dr. Daly, uh, were you able to identify a uh, uh, description of the grade three events, local and systemic to respond to Kat, Dr. Kaling's question? Yeah, I, I don't think that we have those summarized um, other than uh, the, the data we've showed. Um, Lisa, are they highlighted in your in your manuscript, in, in your New England Journal publication? Well, I think that the grade three and four events are shown on, on your uh, bar graph, and there are very few. Um, specifically, the what we've pointed out multiple times is that um, fever was extremely rare, um, and uh, con in contrast to some other vaccines. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking in terms of the grade three, four. I mean, the, the solicited adverse events are are a clearly defined, predefined um, set of of complaints. And I'm not sure what you're asking actually. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. I'll be happy to provide some clarity. Uh, I was trying to understand how long it took the persons that had grade three uh, um, um, symptoms, how long it took for those to resolve, and did they differ by the 
um, local reactogenicity. <clears throat> thank you. Ah, well, thank you. That that does help. Um, yes, the um, the grade three fours did not necessarily last any longer. Um, there were a relatively small proportion of people whose solicited adverse events lasted longer than seven days. Um, it was in the double digits of like maybe 10 or 15 of any of the events um, that lasted longer than, than uh, seven days. Uh, and I don't think there was any difference between the more severe uh, complaints versus. The, the median durations were stable between severities. Yeah. Okay, and then the one other question I have is, um, is lymphadenopathy a common finding? No, it's not. Um, it's, I, I, I would have to go back and look at, to find the absolute number, but I think it's in single digits. Um, and we can look at that. We did not collect lymphadenopathy as a, spe a specified solicited adverse event. Thank you. Let's move on to Dr. Daly for the last question. Okay, thanks so much. So, so first, so I have uh, several safety and several uh, efficacy questions, and my safety questions were largely addressed prior to this because I, I always appreciate additional detail about grade three and grade four uh, SAEs and deaths, even if there was no imbalance um, in the vaccine versus placebo arm. An, an additional safety question, and then I have uh, a couple of vaccine efficacy questions. The safety question is just if you could provide a little bit more detail about what's known about the safety of saponin as an adjuvant and other, other vaccines, um, and then I'll uh, follow that with some efficacy questions. Yeah, so, so this uh, other versions of saponin-based adjuvants that have, have been used extensively. And frankly, we've used it also extensively in our other clinical development programs, including um, uh, influenza, where we had a, a really very nice phase three study that ran out a couple of years ago. And it's also being used in the malaria vaccine we're associated with in Western Africa. And in, in that study, the uh, same dosage levels were taken down by children as young as five months of age, and it was thought to be tolerable. Uh, as far as this COVID vaccine, our vaccine, uh, our partners in India have taken uh, this adult dose down into children as young as two years of age. Uh, and also uh, that is thought to be tolerable without any safety uh, signals detected to date. Those are relatively small studies, uh, you know, just uh, several hundred to several thousand individuals. So the saponin story is, is that it really uh, has a two-fold uh, um, activity. It has a very short local react uh, activity where it uh, induces cytokine chemokine production and recruits antigen presenting cells to the injection site. Uh, and that all resolves by 72 hours. And a slightly prolonged activity in the draining lymph nodes uh, where it, there's increased uh, antigen uptake uh, presentation and it induces a, a polyfunctional CD4 immune response and high levels of neutralizing antibody. And this short duration, we think, is really uh, associated with the short duration of reactogenicity events that we displayed. Uh, that's just the way this adjuvant works. Okay, great. And then, and then I have these two vaccine efficacy questions to close. If we could pull up slide BX36, which I think is showing IgG antibody titers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I. I'm, you know, reassured that a booster provides good antibody titers, but I, but recognizing that we're here today to take a look at uh, the primary series, which is essentially the left side of this. And so can you help me understand these are titers, but were there any pseudo virus neutralization studies that were done or what do, what do we infer about protection against Omicron here from, from primary series, left side of the graph? Um, yes. Yeah, so it's difficult to, compare apples and oranges. So as far as the pseudo, pseudovirions, we, we, uh, we don't have those yet. They were against BA1 and the Omicron series you're talking about specifically. And that's data that, that is evolving now. Um, the levels of, um, let, me, let me pull up the quotes of protection, maybe this will be uh, reassuring. Um, so this is the data that I referenced earlier that was supported by the, the USG and, and uh, 
uh, driven by uh, University of Washington. And you can see that uh, at a international unit, roughly 7,000, they, they thought correlated with 95% efficacy, 1,000 uh, at 80% efficacy. And if you drop it even an order of magnitude lower, you still have 65% efficacy. So if you if you think of that kind of order of, of decreasing magnitude of immune response and think back to uh, slide 36, um, I mean, I, I think you, you, it wouldn't be unreasonable to, uh, to assume that there would be some level of protection uh, provided uh, even after two dose primary series where there's a you know, one order of magnitude change. Okay, right. thanks, um, that's very helpful. Right. Sorry. Yeah, so this was uh, Dr. Mauer. I was just gonna reiterate that. So I mean, what the correlate protection showed was that you can drop the IgG antibody titer 70 fold um, and still have around 65% protection. And as Dr. Kvatsky mentioned, we're seeing drops here of around 10 to 15 fold. So, you know, while we don't have efficacy data for these Omicron variants, based on the, the correlate, they should still provide good levels of protection. Okay, great. And then my, my thank you for that. And, and seeing those two in juxtaposition was helpful for me, uh, at least. Um, so could you speak to what's known about vaccine efficacy against hospitalization and death, either from phase three trials or from post-authorization trials elsewhere in the world? Thank you. So in the placebo-controlled portion of our study, which is the only one where we had the comparators, the, the, the protection from hospitalization and, and death was complete 100%. Now, that being said, I think it's important to acknowledge what we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, in that those cases of hospitalization we weren't able to get the PCR done at our central lab or that it was done in the local hospital where the people were, were hospitalized. The, the uh, total count in the U.S.-Mexico uh, phase three study is that there were six hospitalizations, including one death in the placebo group uh, versus zero in the vaccine group. And then any estimate from elsewhere in the world in post-authorization? Thank you. Yeah, those, those post office physician data simply aren't available yet. So, so no, although I have to say that also the, the um, prevention of severe disease has held up in, in all of our studies, um, whether it be in South Africa or the UK or the US. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it would be helpful, I think, to the committee, in the, particularly in the context of um, Omicron, uh, to have um, an update on the post authorization data when it becomes available. So if you could please share that with the committee, that would be wonderful. I'm gonna ask folks to mute their phone, please. I think we're hearing some background noise. Um, in the meantime, I, I, it is now, let's see, um, 35 minutes after the hour. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but what I would like to do is move on to the public comment session. Um, so we'll ask the team at CDC if we can um, Proceed. Hey, Dr. Lee, this is Stephanie. Yes, the public commenters are being admitted to the meeting now. Thank you. So I just wanna thank and welcome our public comment speakers today for addressing the committee. Um, all the speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting and then the uh, final list of public commenters was determined via a lottery. Um, for our speakers today, we do have a limited public comment period. So to make it through all the listed speakers, we ask that each speaker limits his, her, or their remarks to three minutes. Um, the timer is available on the screen, so you know how much time you have left. And again, we appreciate the diverse viewpoints that are expressed, that are respectful in nature, and also focused on the issues being discussed at our meeting today. So we look forward to everyone's comments today, and we will start with Dr. Brian Dressen. Yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, my name is Dr. Brian Dressen. I have an extensive career experience thoroughly researching and assessing the degree of safety and efficacy of new products. I have no conflicts of interest and my words are my own. The clinical trials for Novavax revealed incidences of myo and pericarditis, as well as neurological complications like GBS. Post-marketing reports revealed that these adverse reactions continue in the general population. Novavax, like Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, has been temporarily associated with a long COVID-like disability, cardiovascular issues, POTS, neurological disorders, neuropathies, and autoimmunities. A simple look at Australian vaccine injury reports shows Novavax is no different. The CDC and FDA are charged with ensuring the American public is provided with safe and effective vaccines, safe and effective. 
a publication in JAMA Internal Medicine last month examined the safety of mRNA vaccines in more than 433,000 people. 3.1% had Bell's palsy, paralysis, paresthesia, seizure, syncope, or vertigo. 2.7% experienced arrhythmia. 3.4% had thrombocytopenia, anemia, lymphopenia, or neutropenia. 0.75% had a stroke. 0.6% had myocardial infarction. Over 8% of the data set were diagnosed with at least one of the serious adverse events. Compared against previous vaccines, the COVID vaccines are far more dangerous. We are repeatedly assured that serious complications are rare. The World Health Organization defines adverse events happening to one out of 100 persons or 1% taking a drug as common. This report shows that these reactions are common, not rare. You have failed at managing this pandemic. You have failed at ensuring safe and effective vaccines are available to the American people. We have learned via FOIA that the CDC is not performing the required analysis of the pharmacovigilance systems. This is the reason no safety signals are identified. The CDC is not looking for them. The COVID vaccines do not prevent infection or transmission and cause serious harms to some of those who take them. The continuation of the pandemic is evidence that the COVID, the COVID products are not effective. Data have been presented today showing low expectation of protection for current variants. My wife was severely injured by a single COVID vaccine dose in the clinical trial. Rather than report her reaction, the drug company dropped her from the trial and left her out of the report. We must do better. Those injured in a trial are a critical piece of vaccine safety data. They are being hidden, ignored, tossed aside, and forgotten. My life's family has changed forever. The clinical trials are not appropriately evaluating the data. The FDA and CDC and the drug companies continue to deflect the persistent and repeated cries for help and acknowledgement, leaving the injured as collateral damage. You have a very clear responsibility to appropriately assess the safety and risks of these vaccines. It is obvious that this is not happening. Serious questions regarding pregnancy, heart problems, phase three reactions, missing work, and others have been raised today without answer. I ask, does this show that we can say they're safe? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll move to Mrs. Aubrey Fick. Hello, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Okay, 15 months ago, I received one dose of the Pfizer vaccine and my life has not been the same since. Within hours of receiving the vaccine, I developed neck spasms and a heavy feeling in my head. Two weeks later, symptoms rapidly progressed. I developed internal vibrations in my brain, paresthesias, electrical shock sensations, tremors, neuropathy, vertigo, blurred vision, heart palpitations, chest pain, tachycardia, tinnitus, and joint pain. It became difficult to walk as sometimes my legs would suddenly stop working. Sleep was next to impossible. When I finally would fall asleep, my body would completely jolt wide awake as though I had been electrocuted and I would be gasping for air. Each night I went to sleep, I feared my heart would stop and I would not make it to the night. I went to the emergency room and was quickly dismissed by the ER doctor who suggested that I had anxiety or acid reflux. I was advised to take Tums and sent on my way. I was utterly shocked and knew then that I would be facing this battle alone with no support from the medical community. To this day, I continue to suffer from a variety of neurological issues, particularly neuropathy and POTS symptoms. As a formerly healthy 35-year-old woman, this experience has been traumatizing and to watch the aftermath has been appalling. I experienced significant challenges in reporting to VAERS and Pfizer that have left me deeply concerned about the tracking of adverse events. I permanently scoured the internet and found social media groups with thousands of others suffering neurologically whose lives have been drastically altered. We are routinely silenced, labeled as misinformation and met with an incredulous eye. We are simply citizens of the United States of America that trusted that our government would provide aid and research in the event of adverse events. We need full acknowledgement and disclosure of neurological reactions from our federal agencies so that the medical community can be made aware. We need robust, large-scale research funding so that healthcare providers can be equipped with the necessary knowledge and possible treatments. How is progress to be made if we simply have small research studies with three or four cases? Why were we affected? What about our bodies caused it to attack itself and our autonomic nervous system to stop functioning properly? Doctors should not have to fear repercussions from the medical board in the event they come across the patient adversely impacted, and patients should not have to be gaslit in their nightmare. I urge you to assist in creating a dialogue where vaccine injury can be openly discussed. If this happened to your wife or your child, I trust that you would desire transparency, 
swift investigation and research funding. I trust that you would not want their stories censored. We must be compassionate and take urgent action on all those suffering in the pandemic, irrespective of modality. We must be cognizant of using sweeping generalizations that the vaccines are safe and effective, when clearly for my body and thousands of others, it was toxic. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Ms. Ashley Scott. Hi, can you all hear me? We can, thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Scott. I am the Policy and Outreach Coordinator with Blue Star Families, a 501c3 organization that conducts IRB-approved studies of the experience, perceptions, opinions, and um, beliefs of military and veteran-connected families with our partners at Syracuse University. Respondents to our April 2021 COVID Collaborative Pulse Check poll indicated that having a choice in which a uh, vaccine to receive would increase their likelihood of receiving it. And this phenomenon is particularly prominent among active duty service members. Um, when we conducted the poll again in April of 2021, 66% of active duty respondents who were unvaccinated and had no appointment scheduled reported that the opportunity to choose their vaccine would increase their likelihood of receiving a vaccine. The same was true for 43% of active duty spouses, 41% of veterans, and 48% of veteran spouses. And again, those are just of the respondents to our COVID collaborative pulse check poll. Based on these results, we believe it is possible that expanding vaccine choices could increase the likelihood of receiving the vaccine in military connected populations. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll move to Ms. Elizabeth Dietz. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, committee members and those listening to today's meeting. My name is Liz Dietz, and while I'm a member of Vaccinate California, today I'm speaking for myself. My daybook tells me that I first expressed concern about this new pneumonia in the Far East 888 days ago. This committee has worked tirelessly over those days and I appreciate the efforts you have made to make the decision factors public and transparent. I'm also an active member of a Facebook group, Vaccine Talk, an evidence-based discussion forum that has almost 79,000 members worldwide. Some of the Vaccine Talk members are physicians, virologists, and other professions involved in vaccine safety. These experts have volunteered their time to educate other members. Today, I especially want to recognize two of them, Vincent Mianelli, MD, who has developed a web resource, Vaxipedia, which is addresses vaccine questions in a timely manner, and Nathan Boonstra, MD, who co-hosts the podcast, Vax Talk, sponsored by uh, Voices for Vaccine. At Vaccine Talk, one theme about in the conversation about vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy and vaccine anxiety has been largely been expressed around the newness and to them the strangeness of the mRNA vaccine technology. Some of those folks who previously said, I'm not taking a COVID-19 vaccine yet, have also indicated that the vaccine discussed today, Novavax, would be acceptable. If Novavax is approved for use in the U.S., I am hoping that data will be gathered on the number of recipients who had previously refused vaccines, as opposed to those who had found access difficulty, to see if the hypothesis that having a choice makes a difference. Going forward in public health planning, planning a more robust and effective public information platform in my view, would reduce vaccine hesitancy. As you all know, there's a large literature on how to address vaccine hesitancy, and I hope the government can recruit and train community level experts. Thank you again, committee members, for your work. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have Lindsay Burmeister. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. I want to start by acknowledging to the committee that I attest that I have no financial conflicts of interest. My name is Lindsay Burmeister and I am COVID vaccine injured. I have multiple neurological issues, including brain inflammation due to the Moderna vaccine that I received in March of 2021. In my quest for healing, I've come across communities of individuals with debilitating neurological adverse reactions like mine. 
I'm one of the founding members of an independent nonpartisan group of COVID vaccine injured in Washington state called CVIWA. We have met with the offices of several members of Congress in our state and have done multiple media interviews in respected publications and medical journals. Due to the intentional suppression of our reactions by the CDC, FDA, and social media outlets, the injured are unable to find support and access essential medical care. There is no funding for research, and there is no recovery plan or financial support available for us. As of July 2022, the CICP has received almost 6,000 injury or death claims from the COVID vaccine products and has yet to pay out a dime. Both Britain and Canada have started paying out COVID vaccine injury claims. Even Thailand has compensated over 14,000 people around $50 million to settle COVID vaccine injury claims. Again, by contrast, the U.S. has paid out nothing. We were asked to protect others by getting this vaccine, only to find out that there is no support or protection for us in return. The total COVID vaccine injury is filed in the VAERS database as of June 2022 with 878,425 claims. And we know that only 1% to 10% of injuries are actually reported to that system. The claims are grossly underreported. And yet, this number continues to climb. More and more people know someone whose health has been negatively impacted by the COVID vaccine products, and yet you stay silent. This lack of transparency is eroding the public's trust in your agency. CDC, we need you to acknowledge us. Hear me when I say we need help. Without an acknowledgement from the CDC of our injuries, proof of causation cannot be met, and in many cases, doctors refuse to believe us or treat us. The injured are losing their homes, their jobs, their insurance. They are going into massive debt, and in some cases, they are losing their lives. We did our part. You assured us this was safe, and we are suffering. It is time the government stepped up and put money and resources to this effort. We are pleading for help. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Martha Nolan. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Nolan, and I am speaking on behalf of Healthy Women, the nation's leading nonprofit health information organization for women, providing consumers and healthcare providers accurate evidence based information about diseases and conditions, innovations in biomedical research, and changes in policy that impact the treatment and care women receive. We requested to speak today to encourage the committee to recommend usage of the protein based vaccine against COVID 19 that was recently approved by FDA that will be administered as a two-dose primary series given three weeks apart. Providers need more options to reach those who remain unvaccinated in our country while the pandemic continues. COVID has been particularly devastating to Black and Latinx populations. While the disease is expected to reduce overall life expectancy in, um, in, in 2020 by just over a year, estimated reductions for Black and Latinx populations are three to four times now as for whites. There are many reasons for vaccine hesitancy, as some have concerns or believe the massive misinformation efforts around using the mRNA technology and vector designs and do not understand how they work. For those, perhaps the use of a more traditional protein-based vaccine designed similarly to the more well-known flu vaccines might overcome hesitancy. There are also millions of vulnerable Americans who have limited options for protection against COVID-19 and remain isolated and frustrated that they could be left on the sidelines while society continues to disregard safety protocols. I'm referring to the estimated 7 million immunocompromised individuals in the US for whom the stakes may be even higher than they were two years ago. We know that current vaccine treatments don't work for everyone and some are unable to take any of the options now offered. And the risk to those who remain vulnerable to disease, severe disease, including COVID-19 is compounded today by the removal of mass requirements, a push to return to normal and ever diminishing social distancing and caution by individuals. Organ transplant patients and those who rely on medications that suppress their immune systems do not feel protected. People living with conditions that compromise the strengths of their immune systems, such as HIV, cancer, and many autoimmune diseases feel exposed. And many older Americans who manage their chronic conditions through multiple medications are now severely limited in their options for treatment, given the fear of drug interactions. We believe having a more traditional protein-based COVID-19 vaccine option available would help overcome any of these issues. Additionally, having a simpler storage method that could make the vaccine more widely distributed to rural and inner cities, as well as healthcare practitioners who do not have ability to store refrigerated vaccines 
will create greater vaccine access in the U.S. and around the world, particularly in areas that typically do not have equitable access to vaccines. We thank this committee for its tireless work and for diligently remaining at the forefront of this evolving threat to our health and well-being. Your work is critical to the fight against COVID-19, and we hope you will provide a recommendation in favor of more vaccine options. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I want to um, take the time to just thank all of our public comment speakers today. Um, we are going to take a brief break, um, looking at the time. Why don't we take until um, five minutes after the hour? We are running behind, but um, I, I do think we need a break. So let's, five minutes after the hour, we will reconvene. Thank you. <laughs> 